Hello, I'm John David Ebert, um, and what I wanted to do now is to go through a series of 12 videos, and I'm doing this at the request of a friend of mine who wanted me to look into this text, Rene Ganon's book that was published in 1945, uh, The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times, uh, which is generally considered Ganon's masterpiece. Rene Ganon was a, a French intellectual uh, born about a hundred miles outside, in a small town about a hundred miles outside of Paris and uh, in 1886 and uh, he died in 1951 so this was getting near the end of his career uh, when he wrote this, he was about 59 years old, 1945 and this book came out right at the end of World War II and it was an instant bestseller like Spangler's Decline of the West and I think uh, I want to invoke this comparison here between Rene Ganon and Spangler and also uh, Heidegger and Jean Gebser because I think he's he belongs in this group in a certain way. He's doing a certain kind of thing that they're doing, which is a resistance to modernity and modernization. Um, this is coming from a French uh, intellectual who's very interested in the esoteric traditions. Uh, he converted to Islam at one point. He spent most of the rest of his life living in Egypt, in, in Cairo. Um, and he was a member of various sects, um, made fun of theosophy, didn't like it at all, thought it was just made up by dilettantes with a uh, syncretistic understand, misunderstanding of symbols profusely thrown together in a hodgepodge that makes no sense and ruins the traditions. And the thing about Ganon here, so far I've only read the first chapter of the introduction, but the thing about Ganon is what he wants to do is a kind of restoration. Uh, it's very similar in essence, structurally, to what Heidegger does what Heidegger called an Abbau. An Abbau, or a Destruction, as it's pronounced in German, um, is uh, an attempt to go back and recover uh, an original understanding, in his case of being, uh, the original understanding of being as Fusus was for him the golden age. It was the thing that he wanted to recover, bring it back. Uh, the Greek pre-Socratic, not Platonic, this is before Plato and Aristotle, pre-Socratic understanding of being as Fusus in which entities simply uh, autonomously arise, flash forth, and disintegrate. They, they simply come out of the darkness, flash forth uh, a sense of self-luminous numinosity and wonder, and then disintegrate, go back into the darkness again. This is, the, for him, the model of being that he wants to resurrect and bring back. This is called an op bow. Um, and this type of being is something that he feels uh, has been occluded, and covered up, being has been forgotten by beings, occluded, covered up uh, over the years by cliches, misunderstanding, misunderstandings, and especially the idea that he combats here, uh, which you'll find I think is structurally homologous to what Rene Ganon means by the reign of quantity, uh, is the idea of the understanding of being as for Handenheit, which is basically the understanding of being in the metaphysical age, or at least in the latter part of the metaphysical age, let's say from the time of Descartes on down, uh, the understanding of being as for Handenheit uh, is a capturing of beings, removing them from their world horizons and contexts, and putting them into a Cartesian metaphysical space, phase space with the X, Y, Z vectors, so that they can be quantized, translated into purely quantitative elements that can then be translated into mathematical equations that can map them, chart them, uh, map their vectors, uh, whatever qualities they have are going to be purely objective. Uh, so they're shorn basically, as Ganon will say, they're, they're shorn of their qualities. That is to say their sense of being entities that have a relationship to an environment, a world horizon, uh, entities with a relationship to a particular geography, a particular place in the landscape where a theophany might have happened up on that hill with that tree. <laughs> You take entities and you put them into this metaphysical phase space and it robs them, it denudes them, uh, and just turns them into purely quantitative mathematical entities. Heidegger spent his life combating this idea. It's basically the same thing as what Ganon is talking about here by the reign of quantity. Now by quantity, well, I want to point out one other thing here is that um, the Der Deridian deconstruction that, that often traces its roots back to the Heideggerian uh, destruction or op bow is totally exactly the opposite of what Heidegger was doing. What Derrida wants to do is to go back, find the original metaphysical bivalent ontologies and dismantle their legitimacy, completely 
uh, pulling away, uh, pulling the, uh, the, the root out uh, or the bottom out and watching them go down the drain. That's a totally different thing. That's deconstruction. That's the French mentality that was born in the French Revolution, and it comes out of that. Uh, totally different to what, so what Heidegger meant by a destruction, an opbau, recovering the original essence of something, in his case, being. Um, and so what Ganon has here is he sets up his own metaphysical bivalent ontology, in which, as Derrida would say, one term is privileged over the other. So we have quality versus quantity. Uh, and quality for him um, is at the top, let's say, of the world wheel. Um, and the bottom is quantity. And eventually, uh, as this wheel cycles down, and quality for him is associated with form, quantity is associated with matter, uh, quality is also associated with essence, quantity is associated with substance. So we're going to get the, uh, a myth of the fall here and the gradual cycling down of a wheel into darkness in which material elements will predominate over the spiritual elements, which will then become occluded and lost and forgotten, which is what Ganon says has happened here. So he's going to perform a, a kind of a Heideggerian upbow and recover the traditionalist understanding of what these great uh, multiplicity of qualities was like, these spiritual forms that informed the world and built it and shaped it. He wants to recover that edifice and bring it back in and say that modernity has lost this. <laughs> Modernity is at the bottom of a world age, a world cycle here. Now, indeed, he's going. He invokes right in the introduction the Hindu myth of the. He was a Hindu specialist. The Hindu myth of the Manvantara, which ends up with a Kali Yuga. The Kali Yuga is the darkest period of a Manvantara. Uh, but note that in Indian metaphysics, the, Man, the Manvantara is a predetermined cosmological cycle that cycles of itself endlessly over and over again. Uh, in which all the events of history simply keep happening over and over again, rather pointlessly, uh, one would assume if they keep happening over and over again. There's no progress model, there's no development towards something. We just simply have this idea of four world ages, a krita, the first world age, and it's to be imagined as a circle made out of four quarters. So all four quarters are present. Each one has a chunk of virtue, dharma, linked to it, which is maximized in the golden age of the krita yuga, uh, and these are modeled after dice throws, Krita Trita Divapara Kali. These are dice throws. The best dice, dice throw uh, is the four. Uh, but it also refers to a cow standing on four legs. Um, so you're to imagine it that way. In the, in the Krita Yuga, everyone performs their dharma perfectly. Everyone lives in perfect accordance with their anthropological types, with their imaginary significations. Everything is working perfectly. Spiritual principles are guiding the society in a Krita Yuga, and it works perfectly. But the Krita Yuga lasts for uh, 1,728,000 years. Then it declines into the Trita Yuga, where, uh, and Trita means three, tree, tri, thrice, uh, tre, uh, it means three, the Trita Yuga. The cow is now standing on three legs, and so we're to imagine our circle as lit up. Uh, one quarter is now dark, and we've got three light quarters. Um, and the virtues are declining. Uh, people are getting more aggressive and assertive. You're starting to see values disintegrate. Then this world age lasts for 1,296,000 years. So in our little disk, we've got two dark quarters now down to the duality or opposition of basically the light and darkness uh, in the age of the Dvapara Yuga. Dva obviously means it's related to duo, two. Uh, the cow standing, trying to balance precariously on two legs, the Dvapara Yuga, which lasts for 800, 864,000 years. Once that cycles out, we've got three black parts of the circle, and one quarter is left. That's the Kali Yuga. It's the worst dice throw you can get. You throw that throw, it's bad luck. Kali is related to terms like uh, Kalaha, stress, strife, quarrel, uh, black things. Uh, dark things happening. So there's a maximization here of entropy in this final world age, which traditionally the Hindus ascribe, uh, they say, began in the year 3102 BC, but it lasts for 432,000 years. So it has a long way to work work its way through here in the present cycle of what's called a Mahayuga, which lasts, all of these added up last for 4,320,000 years, 
That's a Maha Yuga, a great cycle. Um, so in the Kali Yuga, this is this is the reign of darkness over spirituality, in which uh, couples are united for lust, not for love. Money is the primary virtue. No one will do anything uh, without doing it for money. Um, so we have money, we have lust, we have uh, people betraying each other, chaos in the social order. The kind of types are disintegrating, um, and the, nobody's behaving in accordance with their anthropological type. Um, there's a lot going on here. I, I see Ganon's point that a lot of this is taking place now in modernity, and this is basically the same myth that Spangler in The Decline of the West evokes in an indirect way, but it's the same world myth uh, of a predetermined cycle. I think this cycle originally came from astronomy, which is why it goes round and round and round. And you can see the numbers as you get, uh, what, you know, a thousand maya yugas are supposed to equal what's called a kalpa, one kalpa. And each kalpa is divided into 14 manvantaras. Um, and each of those has 71 and a quarter maha yugas, each of which ends with a flood. That 71 and a quarter or so uh, is a key number for the procession of the equinoxes, which every 72, 72 years, uh, the procession moves one degree uh, along the horizon backwards. Um, so there are key numbers here that are give us, a, I think, a clue that all of this is embedded in Indian astronomy, mathematics, and the study of the cycles of the stars, which is implacable. You can't pray to the sun to stop rising. It won't. You can't pray to the moon to do anything different than what it's predisposed to do. It won't. So th this is inscribed in the dharma of the cosmos. It's the way, the rata, as the, the Vedas would put it, of things. And you, you can't do anything about it. It's absolutely predetermined. Now, it's this way, too, in Spengler, with the decline of the West, uh, in which uh, he has a predeterministic model of four world ages also. But this has come by way of the Greek tradition from Goethe, who got it from Vico. Vico, uh, in a, around the year 1700 or so, resurrected it from Hesiod. So you look at Hesiod's Theogony, uh, and you get the four world ages in there, and uh, or the works and days, it may be. Uh, where you get the four world ages there. And note that with the Greeks, this predeterministic cycle that they have has, for the first time, technological associations associated with it uh, because it's linked with the metals, the gold age, the golden age, the silver age, the bronze age, and then finally the iron age in Hesiod. Note that the West already has this kind of technological bent, what Ganon would call, you know, a uh, predisposition toward quantity. You know, right from the start. The golden age, gold is connected with the sun, silver is connected with the moon, bronze is made up out of copper and tin, copper is associated with Venus, uh, tin is associated with Jupiter, iron is uh, corresponds to Mars, so you've got some astronomy linked in there uh, as well, but there's this idea of a gradual decline from the golden age to the silver age, uh, and then to the bronze age, uh, you know, you move from the age of the gods, let's say the golden age is the age of the reign of uh, Saturn, of Kronos, and then the Silver Age becomes the reign of Zeus, who overthrows uh, the rule of uh, Saturn, uh, overthrows the Titans, and inaugurates a new age of the gods, which then declines into the age of the Mycenaean heroes, who only use bronze weapons. And the Greeks knew very well that their iron technology had been preceded by a Mycenaean bronze technology. Homer is aware of this in the Odyssey and the Iliad. Uh, they knew that a Bronze Age was associated with the great Mycenaean warriors, uh, and then that the Dorians had brought in ironworking and brought about uh, the Iron Age in which they were living, in which Hesiod saw as the age in which the Greeks were presently living, the age of the decline of virtue, people treating each other badly, society lost, uh, all the social forms are gone, they're disintegrating. So Hesiod carries this model. Vico picks it up with his book, uh, The New Science. He translates it into this idea that every civilization has this own it has its own cycle that's like this, which he called uh, the age of the gods, the age of the heroes, the age of people, and then the prolia or recorso, uh, the age of the gods, in which you get a theocracy at the start of every civilization. Everything is motivated by religion. Then you move into the aristocratic age, the age of uh, heroes, the aristocratic age, the rise of princely palaces. Everything shifts to the power of the aristocracy, and then. In the democratic age of the people, you get a decline. Uh, democracy, 
uh, for Vico is the worst uh, political form, as it was for many of these guys, Plato and Aristotle, the, the worst political form imaginable, uh, turning everything over to the people, and then finally you get uh, this, what Vico calls a recorso, in which everything disintegrates, uh, and that's it for that civilization, and you move on to the next civilization. So Goethe picked up this model, and he just wrote a brief one-page paper in which he's got these four, uh, he's got these four, I forget what they are, there are four different parts to his cycle of a world age, a theological, I think, a, poet, a philosophical, a poetic, and then finally a prosaic age, uh, a gradual decline there. Spangler picked that model up, but what he did was he synthesized it with Goethe's metamorphosis of plant model, uh, and he took this idea and he said, what if civilizations were actually like plants, like the Urpflanza that Goethe describes in the metam Metamorphosis of Plants, which goes through a predetermined life cycle with a distinct series of stages. And every plant does this. Every plant is a variation of this Urpflanza life cycle. So Spengler sort of wedded this botanical idea with the older astronomical idea inherited uh, from Hesiod and Vico uh, to combine it with civilizations and to say, uh, in this case, the predetermination that we find in the Hindus, which is nailed in the, into the astronomy of the mathematics of these whirling bodies, here is predetermined because living organisms have predetermined life cycles. Everyone's got, the human being has a predetermined life cycle. You're not going to live past the age of 100. Uh, in most cases, you're not even going to make it to 90. Ideally, you might make it to 80. But nonetheless, uh, you're not really biologically programmed to live much longer than 100. Um, so there's a, and there are certain stages in the life cycle, childhood, teenage, uh, in which the cognitive qualities change. There are certain structural associations, the way a teenager thinks, it's totally different from the way a kid thinks, the way a grown adult thinks with matured reason, uh, capable of governing his desires and his id, uh, with rationality. That's a totally different thing now going on. And then in old age, uh, there are different characteristics there. So there are different cognitive characteristics to the human life cycle. They're predetermined, just as there are different biological structural characteristics. You know, I'm 49 now. I'm, you know, I'm gaining weight now. My metabolism is slowing down. I've got gray hair now. Uh, th that was all predetermined. There was nothing I could have done to prevent these morphological things happening to me at age 49 that I'm finding now happening to me. So it's a predetermined life cycle biologically. But then Spangler says, now what if civilizations actually were superorganisms that were just like this? Let's say that a civilization comes into being like a plant does with a predetermined life cycle of about a thousand years. Uh, it may live longer than that in a state of dead petrifaction, a state of Kali Yuga that just goes on forever. But each one of these civilizations, and he lists nine of them, the Sumerian, uh, Sumerian Babylonian, the Egyptian, Chinese, Indian, uh, Hellenic, uh, Faustian, uh, the Islamic Arabian, uh, each one of them comes into being with a predetermined life cycle that moves from, uh, and he also maps it onto the four seasons, the, the springtime phase in which the springtime forms are always religious. You get massive forms of architecture, new death cults that come in, visionaries who come in with spiritual founding religious ideas that open up a new world horizon and create what Heidegger would call an Aragonist event in which um, there's a new way of being, a new way of understanding that comes in that's coded into the religious forms that people have to abide by. This would correspond to a kind of Krita Yuga or a golden age. Uh, so Spangler sees this, each civilization then moves into a, a ripe summer period where it efflorescences, it's at its apogee. You get great art. The civilization's art at this point has now matured, like an artist who matures over time, getting better and better, reaching an apogee. The arts are in form, what he calls their in form. They're the best they can be. Thinking is metaphysical now, not religious. Um, and the civilization produces its best uh, great intellects. And then it moves into its autumn period, which is a late period in which rationalism now comes in to dominate. This is the French with, let's say, Rousseau and Voltaire and the French Enlightenment, uh, followed by the French Revolution, the rise of rationalism and uh, rationalism coming on stage, sterilizing and disintegrating all the culture forms with reason that gradually then declines into the winter stage, which Spangler saw for Western 
Faustian civilization setting in the 19th century with the rise of industrialization, uh, the rise of materialist philosophies, uh, grand metaphysical idealist philosophies like Kant, Goethe, and Fichte uh, decline into uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, John Stuart Mill, um, how to, everything becomes very pragmatically oriented. Uh, everyone's trying to solve social and economic problems. Cities are getting gigantic, full now with rooted, uprooted populations who have come pouring in from the countryside looking for work, uh, swarming with populations now that create new hive structures, uh, such as our skyscrapers. And the, Roman, uh, the, the Romans had multiple story buildings, too, that would, were built to house cheap, cheap masses that would often disintegrate and fall apart and uh, crumble on people. So this is Spangler's adaptation of the predeterministic model that in the Hindus was originally connected with the cycles of uh, the heavens, the cycles of uh, the planets, which was absolutely predetermined. It's predetermined too uh, for both Vico, Goethe, and Spangler. And I think now for Rene Ganon, who comes in and says, we're in a Kali Yuga. The reign of quantity is the reign of the understanding of everything as pure numbers devoid of qualities. By contrast, in the qualitative period, the early period when you had traditionalist sciences like Pythagorean numbers, Pythagorean numbers are numbers that have qualitative metaphysical associations. For example, uh, odd numbers being linked, with, uh, odd numbers are masculine, uh, even numbers are feminine. Uh, they have these qualities to them. Uh, numerology comes out of that, in which numbers resonate with lots of metaphysical qualities. And for Ganon, numbers uh, are just purely quantitative, bald units um, in which they just simply represent uh, a multiplicity of bald quantitative units. And that kind of thinking has given birth and rise to materialism, uh, brought us to the end of this Manvantara, the Hikosis of Manvantara, um, the Kali Yuga, and we're in the era of the reign of quantity now. And so what he's going to do as we move through this text um, one final note before we conclude this introduction is that, of course, all of this is to be contrasted with the model. Uh, there's another model. Uh, I think actually we'll save that. We'll excavate the, the linear model uh, next, and we'll contrast those two with the cyclical model that repeats over and over, or in Spengler is simply predetermined, uh, with the linear Christian Islamic Zoroastrian model, where we have for the first time history as a series of singularities non-repeatable occurrences, the incarnation of Christ, the crucifixion, uh, each with an iconotype that is a singularity unto itself, uh, and in which there's a linear model of gradual ascent, not a decline from an initial golden state, but a gradual ascent in perfection. Jacob Bernowski's uh, series, The Ascent of Man. We've ascended. This is the scientific model uh, that we're using technology to create the New Jerusalem on Earth. And this is something Titus Burkhardt, another one of these esoterists, wrote about in his book on Chart, Chart Cathedral, where he talked about in that book, he says how each of those cathedrals were designed in mind specifically to be physical realizations of the New Jerusalem on Earth. This is why they glow internally, why you have multicolored stained glass, because they're meant to, to reflect precious gems, and minerals uh, at the omega point of history. And then that becomes the, that sort of sets the basic metaphysical attitude for the sciences to come in with Francis Bacon, separating the physics from the metaphysics, favoring the physics now, we should concentrate on uh, the new Atlantis, uh, making the world better, improving it, using science to create a utopia, and then we can gradually see society, life, culture, and human values getting better and better. We're moving toward an eschaton. We're moving toward a point in history that is better than anything that's ever come before. And this should be, this is really, Gene Gebser's model comes out of this. It's, it's not a model of decline. If you look at Gene Gebser, you can contrast Gebser with Spangler here, uh, where Spangler's model sees this pessimistic decline into social chaos, into Kali Yuga, um, with uh, Gebser, he takes the entirety of human history and presents it as a gradual awakening of consciousness, um, starting with the archaic consciousness structure, then the magical consciousness structure, then the mythical consciousness structure. Each one is bigger and more complex than the one that precedes it, 
that precedes it. And the mythical consciousness structure is an improvement, decidedly for him, over the magical consciousness structure, as I think the mental consciousness structure, which he says comes in with the Greeks, uh, is an improvement over both of those, eventually leading down to the integral consciousness structure, which he sees coming in uh, at the end of the 19th century uh, as exemplifying the best of all these consciousness structures in which all the previous ones are folded inside of. That's a model of progress there. Gebser's model, I think, surprisingly, turns out to be a progress model in which these consciousness structures are getting more and more illuminated, more and more awake. Um, that's a progress model, and it's totally in opposition to the declension model of Spangler and here to René Guénon. And so with that uh, <clears throat> introduction uh, to René Guénon, we'll proceed from there.